and that means a lot of things. It means the home. We are. I'll talk about. Actually, I just get. I'll just get going. Here we go. So, first of all, who am I? Uh, father, husband of one, another one on the way. Been doing web development for seven years. Currently working at a great company called Weave. We integrate uh, phones. We integrate phone systems into practice management software. It's kind of cool. Uh, we got to do some cutting edge stuff with WebRTC and uh, make it so when at your business, if one of your clients calls, it pops up all their information without you having to do anything right when you answer the phone. So it's really fun. If that interests you, always everyone's always hiring, right, in our industry. Um, loving Node.js, love APIs, and loving <coughs> Angular right now. So that's a little bit about me. Let's get going. So why, why home automation? You're not going to be able to hear it, but uh, we'll give you about a minute of uh, some Wallace and Gromit, if any of you guys are fans. He's like the home automation king of claymation. Um, and this is just one of the, one of the, there's a whole series of, uh, oh, thank you. But you'll get the idea. So essentially, instead of a TV remote, he's, uh, he's got a little contraption that he has to shoot a tennis ball in and uh, watch what happens so that he doesn't have to get off his chair to uh, change the channel. <laughs> uh, Wallace and Grom, it's classic. So, and he's saying, of course he's saying funny things like, oh, this is precision technology. This is amazing. And the, the dog, of course, has the TV remote. And then it, of course, fails and blows up in his face um, like classic Wallace and Gromit does. So. Why, why are we doing home automation? Um, I think these, these are the, the quick breakdowns. So basically, security, you know, you can, you can do a security system, window sensors, door locks, the whole bit. Convenience, being able to control it remotely. Uh, efficiency, power monitoring, um, turning on the AC when you're at home, turning it off when you're not, that kind of thing. And awesome, of course. And so how long have we wanted this? Forever, forever. I mean, it's been in science fiction literature since like the 20s. Um, people have wanted this for such a long time. Looking, dating back to 2001 Space Odyssey, you guys are familiar with Hal, who is a uh, artificial intelligence that powers the, the, their space station, essentially. Um, and that kind of, that's triggered a million things. Spoofs, you know, Simpsons spoofs for the, the automated home that takes over and doesn't let you do anything. Um, but one that jumped out at me in, in, in the history is this guy, Jim Sutherland, basically built a computer in his basement in 1966. It took up the whole basement. This guy's loaded, right? He spends thousands and thousands of dollars. And he calls it the Echo 4. I can't remember what the ac acronym was for. But he does, he controls his temperature in his house. He stores recipes. He even had it trying to inventory his, his cooking, the cooking materials they had at their house for their wife. And this is all back in 1966. And so I was really impressed with that. He got highlighted in an article in Popular Science in 1968. And I think that was a huge catalyst to this home automation, this smart, smart home system, which is really cool. But uh, with that in mind, why, oh geez, what's going on here? Sorry. What is taking so long, right? If it's been, if people have thought about it and actually trying to implement it from that time, why is it taking so long to get to mainstream households? Um, and this the Wikipedia entry sums it up. Um, the lack of a sim single simplified protocol and a high cost of entry has put off consumers. And I love how that they tied great into our keynote today. And I think the model he's got is a, a great model to look at this with for why it, doesn't, why it doesn't happen. No one wants to open up a million iPad apps. So lack of a sim single simplified protocol. These are just the ones I knew off the top of my head. I'm sure there's dozens more. So these are the ones that I've done research on, um, and there's a lot, and they all behave differently, and they all need their own controllers, and so and they all have their own kind of devices, and so it gets kind of confusing. But also the high cost of entry, right? So this is from the X10, which is one of the early, most popular hobbyist protocols in the 90s, and it's still used today, but not nearly as popular, and, and it's just crappy. But um, this is what they had in their Wikipedia entry. They, they put the high-end budget at $100,000 in the 90s and $2,000 minimum to get started for the consumer. Now, that's crazy to spend $2,000 for a bare-bones system. That's just not going to happen, I don't think. 
So, but if you're a Bob Dylan fan, <clears throat> times they are a changing. Barriers to entry are dropping all over the place in this industry. Um, it's getting crazier. The, the equipment's getting cheaper. Um, the software's getting better. And I kind of want to go over some of the things that have come out recently. Um, if you look at some of the home automation stuff that I put on Kickstarter recently, it's been a lot of home, auto, home automation stuff. I just want to point out a couple of them. The smart things is essentially they give you this router. And you, it comes with certain protocols that you can connect to your stuff. But they raised 1.2 million. Now that's nothing to balk at. And that's consumers going in and saying, yeah, I'm going to buy your product for $100 or whatever. And, and they raised that much money. The almond router that they, they haven't launched yet, but they're, they've, they've finished their funding, raised $855,000 for a router that has home automation stuff in it. People are interested in this stuff. Maybe some, and then there's probably a dozen types of programs like this on, that have come through on Kickstarter. This one is just for simply a light dimmer that you can control with your iPhone. And it raised $300,000. That, that's crazy. And then if any of you are involved in this industry, you, you'll recognize the Nest, which is an ex-Apple executive that has gone off and created a smart thermostat. And when I say smart, it really is smart. It tries to monitor your activity, turn it on and off your AC when you're home and you're not home, that kind of thing. And then you get a bunch of one-offs like this, like a Wi-Fi connected bolt lock opener or closer, which I think is hilarious. Um, because for a lot of reasons. Wi-Fi takes up a lot of batteries. This motor, I'm sure, takes up a lot of batteries. I don't see that as a, a long-term successful product, but you never know. I didn't think Facebook was all that cool either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so something else to be aware of, what's changing? The big boys are coming. AT&T just announced this like four days ago, three days ago. They're releasing this product called the Digital Life. It's a home automation system. AT&T wants in your house. Comcast has had Xfinity home for a while. Microsoft bought R2, which is a home automation company, and they're integrating all that software into their Xbox. They want the Xbox to be the media hub for the home and to control your lights and your garage and everything else. And so people are doing it. Google, two years ago, uh, announced Android at home that was going to be, I was going to work on the little Q thing that they had that never got launched because no one was interested. So who knows what's going to happen with that software, but I don't know. And then, of course, you've got the local stars here that I know of, Vivint and Pinnacle. Pinnacle was just acquired by Protection One, and they're all expanding into home automation um, seriously, especially Vivint, who uh, basically has a hardware manufactory, manufactured on their floor building the hardware in their company called 2Gig. They're, they're a big manufacturer in the space. So things are getting crazy, but we don't want commercial clouds, right? We don't want 100 different apps. We want do-it-yourself. We're at an open source conference. But if I want to build my own home automation system, what can we do? We, we need open source software. And that's my passion, is working on this stuff as a hobbyist at my house and trying to make it get to the point where we can make it easy. So I want to show you guys some hardware that I brought with me to show you how you can get started as a hobbyist here. Where is my... The first is Raspberry Pi, okay? So I bought this case, a poly case that goes on top of it. Um, obviously, these things are blown up. $35 for a, a computer that is more than adequate for a home automation system. Um, and if you look at the total cost of the controller, this is retail price, mind you. You know, you're looking at about $110 to get this thing going, which is kind of, which is cool, right? You have a controller now for $100, $110. And that includes, what I choose for my home network is Z-Wave protocol, and this is a Z-Wave stick, and this is the, actually the most expensive piece uh, on Amazon at forty-seven dollars. I looked yesterday, and uh, this is this is the uh, piece that lets me talk to the hardware I have in my house. So, looking at hardware, it's cheaper than ever, right? Then three light switches, a lock, a thermostat. I brought a lock with me today. It's in pieces, but. Uh, this is a Schlage lock, and it, uh, it runs that. I looked it up again yesterday. It's 175 bucks on Amazon, and it connects to Z-Wave Networks and also Zigbee Networks, and we'll go over those protocols in a minute. But pretty cool stuff. And then I got with me also a thermostat. And this is a Z-Wave thermostat built by Radio Thermostat of America, 
And this is actually the company that Vivint uses and uh, I believe Pinnacle uses um, to re they rebrand these as their own, but Radio Thermostat is the one that builds them. And they can they have Wi-Fi ones, they have Z-Wave ones, they have Zigbee ones. So cool stuff there. Um, but what about software? So let me go over some of these technologies, these protocols with you guys so you can get just a quick glance of uh, the differences. But I picked these three out of that huge list that I had before. And the main reason that I picked these three is because when it comes to consumer products, products that you guys can go buy online and just ship them to your house, these three definitely have the most. Um, Insteon, it's got tons of light switches, garage door controllers, things like that. Um, Insteon protocol is kind of like the next level X10 protocol. And when I say that, it means this Insteon will plug into your house, your house power lines and send signals through the power lines. I brought an Insteon controller with me today. You can see it's got a plug that you plug into an electrical socket and then also you've got a USB connection that will go into your controller box. Essentially, you plug this into your Raspberry Pi if you're running an Insteon network. And this is a dual band one. So Insteon also adds a, a wireless uh, spectrum as well. I can't remember what the megahertz is. But it, it will send signals over the power lines and also for devices that support it, it will send a redundant signal through the air, which is kind of cool. And that was to help speed up the signaling and uh, make it more reliable. Because X10, which kind of was the predecessor to Insteon, Insteon was uh, lacking, definitely was slow. And uh, signals would get lost, you know, like 20% of the time. So it was bad. Um, so Insteon's a good choice. But when I did my research on Insteon, thing it was lacking was, of course, the wireless stuff. So they do have wireless sensors for doors and stuff, but I could not for the life of me find a lock, a bolt lock for my house that was NCN compatible. And part of the reason is because those don't hook to the power lines, right? It has to be only wireless. Um, and so that was kind of a deal breaker for me. I didn't want to do that. Um, but on a side note, I wanted to show you guys I did get an NCN light bulb. Um, so this is, oh, geez, computer's not plugged in. So this plugs into your, your light socket, and then the Insteon controller actually communicates with it through the socket. And the reason I decided not to go th with this with my home automation network is because, A, when the light switch is off, I can't turn this on. So that's kind of silly uh, in my mind. Also economically, even though this one's only about $15 to $20, if I can get a light switch that powers four of these for, you know, 30, 30 to 40 dollars, it's still more economical to get a light switch which lasts forever. And these supposedly will last 15 years. I have it in my basement, we'll see how long it goes. Um, so um, that's Insteon. Zigbee is a wi wireless technology, wireless protocol, um, and it uses, it's open source essentially, it's an open protocol. Um, I'm a huge fan of Zigbee. I, I, I hope the future goes there. But the problem is lack of devices right now. There's not a lot of consumer devices that you can go find using Zigbee. Now, a lot of the proprietary companies like Control4, as a big home automation company, are starting to migrate their wireless systems to Zigbee, which is cool and I think that's neat. Um, but until we get a lot of more, until we get more <coughs> consumer devices available on the Zigbee platform, then it's just not it's not good enough. So. Z-Wave is a closed protocol, which is annoying, I know, but there's so many devices out there, like the lock, the thermostat. I've got a couple light switches at my house, all Z-Wave. Pinnacle, Vivint, um, big players in our local market, both use Z-Wave technology. <laughs> and as far as the protocol goes, the difference between those two is pretty significant. Z-Wave is uh, it's a lot easier. Zigbee is a lot more convoluted, and there's a lot more um, um, discrepancy on there's not a lot of conformity between devices right now so for my network I picked Z-Wave now as far as open source software again there's so many and most of these are trying to be all-in-one solutions I guess so I'd say the vast majority of these with the exception of the ones that say Z-Wave in them are essentially trying to be compatible with Z-Wave, Insteon, Zigbee. They want to create, they've got a UI bundled with them. I have yet to see a UI that looks even remotely good 
in these open source offerings. And to be honest, to, I have yet to see a UI that's remotely good in the commercial offerings. So I think there's a lot of room. So what do we do when a community is so fragmented um, that, and we don't have a ton of good options? Well, I mean, what's the next step? Well, of course, it's fragmented even more, right? Um, <laughs> so I'm a huge Node.js fan. Um, I think it's got some good niche use cases. And I know a lot of my Python buddies think I'm an idiot for uh, thinking to do home automation with JavaScript on the server. And they would be so against that. Uh, but here's my argument. Um, JavaScript is event-driven in its foundation, right? It's asynchronous from its foundation. And I think that applies really well to home automation, mainly because you're get, we need to gather events from all your devices. When a door opens, I want to know. When a door closes, when a lock opens, closes, I want to know all those things. When the temperature changes, I want to know what's going on. So event-driven makes, makes JavaScript awesome. Um, popular, and I'm not saying that everyone likes JavaScript, but I'm saying most people have used JavaScript if you're in the web development community. So a lot of people hate JavaScript, but they still are forced to use it in a lot of situations. And I'd say it's probably one of the most popular languages in the world. Um, it's also easy as far as asynchronous programming goes. Um, if you're, when you're new getting into asynchronous programming in JavaScript, sometimes it can be convoluted and confusing. You run one event, you run another event, and this one fires before this one's done, and you're confused. Why is that happening? Um, but as far as asynchronous programming goes, the only other language that I'm familiar with that's asynchronous from the foundation is Erlang, and that learning curve is about magnitude of 10 to JavaScript. But Erlang is cool, don't get me wrong. Being in the VoIP industry, I have to at least look at it. So <laughs> Erlang's cool, but JavaScript's easier. <coughs> and then uh, the community. There is such a cool community, especially here in Utah. We have Utah JS meetings. Uh, they got so big that they actually have north and south meetings, um, and they alternate every. There's th so two meetings a month, and the presentations are awesome. And I made stickers today. If anyone's interested, Utah JS stickers. So come get them after if you want them. Um, so that being said, we say, okay, JavaScript. You're an idiot, Clint, but let's see what you got. Um, so the first, let me kind of explain to you the architecture I'm going to show you guys. First, I'm going to show you guys how I communicate with the raw devices manually with JavaScript. And then I'm going to talk to you about kind of what my plan is Can I take this out? What is this? Oh, okay. Yeah, I have to bump the speaker up there for you in case you have it. Oh, you're the man. Thank you. So let me explain to you what I'm going to show you. First, I'm going to show you the way I communicate with this Z-Wave controller. I'm not going to demo it from the Raspberry Pi, but just know that this if you have Node running on a Raspberry Pi, it will work. I have tested it. This was the one that actually runs my home automation system at my house. Um, so you can run Node on your Raspberry Pi? Yeah, yeah and I, I wouldn't recommend building it yourself. They have pre-built binaries for Raspberry Pi. If you build it yourself, it will take all night, <laughs> which is what I did and learned the hard way. Um, but they do have pre-built ones going. I, didn't, I had no idea it would take that long, but it did. Um, the key here is Node Serial Port, which is an awesome open source project for Node. Pretty much every home automation technology, whether it's Insteon, Z-Wave, Zigbee, these chips, when you hook them up to your controller in whatever way, whatever fashion, are going to expose a serial port for you to communicate with. And then from there, you're dealing with nasty, well, for me, it's nasty because I'm a web developer, but my buddy who's electrical engineering at Purdue, um, he's getting his PhD out there. He's been helping me with this. He loves that stuff, right? So he does all this C coding. And, um, but I'm dealing with hex. You're, just, you're basically sending bytes back and forth to this controller and trying to interpret what's going on. And so after I show you that, I'm going to talk to you about a project that I'm working on. I haven't posted it yet publicly. I'm going to try to do that this weekend because it's not stable or easy to install. But Node uh, Z-Wave is the project I'm working on. And all that is is a wrapper around the communication to the Z-Wave controller. And I'm following the Linux philosophy, which is also the Node philosophy. Do one thing and do it well. And all it's going to be dumb. It's not going to set up rooms and zones for you. All it is is going to say, look, you don't have to work with hex anymore. 
Here's some functions. You can talk to your devices and get data back and, and capture events. So let me open up a demo just really quick. Now, I couldn't get the lock working before I got here, which actually has audible things so you can hear it. But I'll have you verify that this is actually happening since you can't see it. But the target temp here is set to 75. We're going to change it to 70. So I'll let you hold that, and you can watch it and make sure that it actually happens. So let me pull up. <laughs> yes, I'm fine. Yes. <laughs> I don't know who you are, right? <laughs> uh, that's funny. Okay, so let me pull up my thermostat.js, and this is all posted on the uh, GitHub that I'll, I'll show you guys. Now, I, I won't get too much in the nitty gritty, but since a lot of you guys are developers, you can look and see what I'm doing here. But can you see that even? Yes, I can. I wonder if there's a light right over. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. How's that? Okay. Okay. So, first thing I do is I'm taking in the serial port, um, which is an awesome product uh, project, like I talked about. And setting the baud rate, a lot of this stuff you can get from other open source projects like uh, Open Z Wave is written in C, which who wants to work with C? So you just go in and you can steal all that stuff. And, uh, and uh, there, it's a great project. I've emailed the guys, they're great. Um, and then you can see my thermostat ID is an ID of my node network. And before I get into that, I'm going to explain how that works. But pretty much every Z Wave device um, available has some sort of battery power with it. And what you do is when you press the button here, it's in blink mode, and then you'll go add the device um, by pressing a key combination on there that came with the instructions. And that adds it to a node on your network. So it's, it's, it's pretty trivial to get that set up. But then you have to find out what node you're on and things like that, but all doable. Um, and then you have to go and kind of decode what the commands are, and this is where all the, some of the other open source projects come into play, and also my buddy, who's an electrical engineer, really helped me with this. Um, we need to send bytes directly to the controller and say, hey, I need to do this thing. And so um, all the Z-Way protocols start with one. I'm not sure why. And then you send the length of the message so it knows when, to, when it ends. Um, we're sending a request, not a response. This is a, we're sending a data request, the node ID, which is our thermostat. Um, the length of the command class here, and then this is the, the, the command class in Z-Wave, which is essentially saying, hey, I'm doing a thermostat command. I'm setting it in heat mode to Fahrenheit, and, that, and then I set the temp up there, so 75, which could also be a hex value, but Node.js will uh, convert it for you. Um, and then this says, I want an acknowledgment back, and this is a callback ID so that it can be a little bit more asynchronous, and you can track what callbacks get mapped to what not. I think, is it already set to 75? Should I change it? Is it 75? It's 75, yeah. Okay, let's change it to 70. I hope, hope, hope this works. Live demos. Okay, so I'll save it. And let's see, I've got my thermostat.js file right there, which I'm just going to run, and it should do it. So the Z-Wave controller, I sent out that signal, it sent an acknowledgement back, and then set some data back, which I am not doing anything with. I just acknowledged that it came back. But the controller thinks it sent the signal. And it says 70. Yeah! All right. <laughs> it works. So that's how you would set your temperature. Um, but no one wants to do that manually, right? You guys don't want to come in here and say, oh, i got to send all this hex stuff. So the idea behind Node Z-Wave is to kind of get away from that and wrap that hex part um, away from you. And so let me pull up my cloud offering here and show you kind of the uh, functions that Node Z-Wave wraps currently. So get network information. These are all commands that you can send in hex 
to um, to the Z-Wave controller. And so get network information sends you back like a unique ID for that network, uh, things like that. Get nodes sends a list of all the devices that have been added to that controller, which is awesome. That's, that's critical. Abilities is what lets you know um, for on a per device basis what they can do. And so when we're looking at thermostat, that will send back a bunch of things it can do, like thermostat set point and a bunch of commands that it allows. And this all gets abstracted away, but uh, get manufacturer, get version, binary switches, this is where you're going to do on off switches. Um, basically you can say, hey, set my, set my binary switch to on or off, that's going to be a, a, a for, a, for a whole host of things, sprinkler systems, things like that, and then I've got my set, my thermostat set point here, right here. Now there's probably 50 to, no, I mean, I guess there's probably 150 commands left that I have to implement on Node ZUA, but I'm gonna publish this before I do that, though, so that people can start messing with it. Um, but there's, yeah, there's tons of stuff that it can be, that can be done. And, th and the idea, again, behind this is just to be a dumb communication with the ZUA controller that all open source for everybody. Um, now, that being said, looking at like a larger scale, um, me and my buddies have put this together. What the idea is on the Raspberry Pi, this is our Raspberry Pi, and what we want to do is also, you know, we want to get aggressive, right? Uh, we want to put a Zigbee modem in it. We've already got the Z-Wave USB. Um, there's a new, newer uh, Z-Wave chip for the Raspberry Pi, so you don't have to have an ugly USB dongle sticking out of your thing. It actually just pops right in. It's about the same thing. Actually, no, so the dongle, Z, um, Z Wave dongle is only $47. Now the Z Wave chip is $70, which is bizarre that the chip that goes on the Raspberry Pi costs double what the Raspberry Pi costs, but I guess that's just the way chip manufacturing goes. Um, and the idea here is we want this controller, we have all these devices connected to it in the home to your Raspberry Pi, and then you can set up your own cloud if you want. You can put it on Connects Cloud if, you, if you'd like from the keynote this morning, whatever you want to do. Um, but I kind of want to demo in the Wallace and Gromit fashion. Let's see if I have a... Let's see what we got here. I got my, my magic bullet. I'm going to just put it right here. I know you can't see it very well with all this stuff going around, but you'll get the idea. This is a Z-Wave plug. So all it does is on off and send back power signals if I want them. I can say how much power consumption is being used in for, for this plug, plug, this device, whatever I plugged in here. So anything that you can plug in, you can automate, which is awesome. We'll plug it in. Plug in my little magic bullet. I'll make sure it's off. And if anyone wants a smoothie, I got some strawberries. So I didn't cut the I didn't cut the green off yet, so it's not going to be very good. <laughs> Get some fiber, right? Actually, Tyson left these at my house like two weeks ago, so they're not going to be good anyway. <laughs> but yeah, well, for demonstration purposes, I want to show you guys communicating to the Z-Wave device through a little cloud I have set up on 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 my uh, system here. So normally when you have a magic bullet, you put it in, it's on. But I want smoothies in the morning, and uh, I'm really groggy in the morning, and I don't want to have to come down and get everything ready, so I just leave that overnight. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, let me fire up my Z-Wave cloud here. Your thermostat, you set the temperature to uh, 54, so that's cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's on the whole house, just keeping just that. that just keeping those good. Uh, so this is my little cloud program that I made, and, and it's in Node.js and Express as well. And so what happens is, theoretically, this would run on a remote device. I spit it up, and it says, hey, I'm listening on localhost 8080 right now, but it would be a public IP, um, and it's using Mongo as a back end. Um, and then I have this, uh, this program, which essentially is the Z Node Z-Wave with, uh, in Node.js, I added a web socket connection and the, the controller, so right now is my computer, but essentially your Raspberry Pi would initiate a connection to the cloud via WebSocket. 
Um, and Node.js, that's another advantage of Node.js. It's like trivial to set up those kind of socket connections. It's so easy. It's easier than Python, which I've been doing it with lately. It's easier than any language I've ever worked with to set up those kind of internet-based uh, protocol connections, which is awesome. Um, and so I start that program, and you can see it's opening the Z-Wave serial port. What it did was send a, the way we have it set up right now is the cloud. When a connection comes in, it says, hey, what, what's your network information? I want to know what your ID is. And it gets the ID, and that, it maps that ID to a login on the cloud, which lets you do things remotely. Um, and so then, this is one of those ones you're like, oh, is this going to work? You can see that in my cloud program, it's logging out things um, in debug. And then I literally just have, um, you can send commands via the WebSocket, but I also exposed a crappy REST API that you can't see up there. But all it does is I have command, you send the command to switch node number, which is two, and then off, but we'll change that to on. And and off. So basically, this is the foundation, and I hope you weren't expecting something more polished, because it's not yet, uh, <laughs> to uh, turn things on and off. Light switch, that would apply to light switches as well, as well as these plugs. Um, let me pull up. So, so where do we go from here? I put some information in here that you can follow. Um, my home automation company is going to be basically just an open source resource. I just put it up, so there's nothing on it yet. But this, week, this weekend, I'm going to post my first uh, instructional how-to on um, programming the Z-Wave interface. And so that way, I can hopefully recruit some help doing all the crappy hacks if, you're, if you enjoy that. But if not, um, there's going to be a good start posted Saturday on there so that you can start fudging around with thermostats, locks, and uh, light switches, which is a great start. Um, but hoping to get uh, garage door openers in there soon because that's something that really interests me. I, I don't want to get up and make sure my garage door is closed. I want to know remotely, right? Um, and then I put my Z way, which again has just a readme in right now, but I'll get that uh, taken care of and put it there. Um, but also, the vision that I have for this is I want, I want to create something like home, home JS is I guess essentially what I want to call it. And that's more of a wrapper around Node Z-Wave, right? It's a cloud offering that's open source that exposes an API to control your home. And I think that's where I, I see the, the future of this going is, is uh, APIs. And maybe, maybe I'm wrong after watching the keynote. Maybe we need to be storing all this data in uh, your personal cloud. But again, even that wouldn't be that hard, right? If you're, if you're creating your own um, interface, storing, storing that information in a personal cloud is not a big deal. And so that's kind of the direction I see this going. And um, yeah, I'm, I want anyone that can, anyone that's interested in this stuff, I'd love, I'd love for you guys to help. And so I went super fast, and I'm over already. I apologize. But uh, thank you for coming. And if there's any questions, please feel free to ask me. So yeah. Um, what do you do about security? It looks like it's a protocol. It seems like anyone on, in your home that knows the device. Right so there's a lot of people coming up with like Z-Wave sniffers and things like that. Yeah. So built into the protocol right now, when you add that device, it creates a pairing with supposedly secure pairing that allows it so that only that device and only that controller can talk to each other. Okay. I have seen people crack that. But at least they're going to have to try it. I can't just like run that same thing. Oh, yeah, no way. Yeah, no way can you just walk in and do that. But security is a huge concern. Zigbee's got the same problem. Um, Z-Wave, it seems like it's a little bit better right now in commercial offerings. But I have seen YouTube videos where they have sniffers and they're sending signals. They can figure out the signals by sniffing it and sending, matching those signals. So it's it's a scary thought if you thought someone could open your door with a, with a computer, right? That's, that's not good. But if you're that smart, you probably make enough money you don't need to rob homes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Anyway. Well, you have like 20 more minutes. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I thought you were apologizing that you had gone over. Okay. Oh, no, no. I, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm short. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I talk so dang fast. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go overtime. No, no, I didn't go overtime. Yeah. So with those other 
libraries that you mentioned, like the Python Z-Wave ones, do they do some of the same, same things that you're doing, or different? Uh, a lot of the same stuff. So Python Z-Wave is actually just a wrapper. One of the cool things I love about Python, right? It connects to open Z-Wave C++ binaries and wraps them. And so you're essentially just using the open Z-Wave binaries in Python as if they're Python objects when really they're C++ objects. So you still have to do a build, um, but I've used that product. It works okay. They're, they're trying to add a little bit more to it. It's not dumb, right? It's not a do one thing well. It's a, it's a we have zones. Like you can add rooms and you can and do things like that. So it's not, it's more of they're trying to go the all encompassing route instead of just doing one piece for this, decoupling it, doing one piece for this, decoupling it, and doing one piece for the GUI, which is the way I think the, is going to be best for the future of home automation. But I don't know. Yeah. Um, what is the industry doing as far as uh, YouTube 4.0? Is, is that even a possibility? So a lot of those um, open, a lot of those Kickstarter projects that I showed you, they come with Bluetooth 4 connectivity in anticipation of those devices coming out. But as far as commercial devices go, there's like, I mean, a resident or retail devices, there's hardly anything that you can find. But the cool part is if you're a hardware engineer, right? You can do those things and, and start the wave. And I know there, there's projects out there doing it. So how, how does it compare as far as the protocol with like the QDN? Like, so Bluetooth 4 is extra, is super low power, similar to Zigbee, um, similar to um, Z-Wave. The difference is Z-Wave and Zigbee are what's called mesh networks. And so while Bluetooth connects to one, as far as I, as far as I know, Bluetooth 4 still connects to a central place and has a limited range. Z-Wave and Zigbee, use every device on your network as a repeater. So if you have one device that's cleared out there and can't <coughs> communicate to your controller, any device between that acts as a relay. And that's kind of the idea. It was designed for home automation. So that's how I can How's the power consumption? Super low, yeah, on all of them, yeah. Very low. So, and Bluetooth 4 is actually better at power consumption than Z-Wave and Zigbee from what I understand, as far as low power. Yeah, supposedly Bluetooth 4 is just ultra low power and a lot of the new devices coming out with it. I don't know if you guys have seen that new fitness program they're doing that's like a wristband that connects Bluetooth to your phone and then tries to detect what exercises you're doing. But supposedly that battery lasts forever. So, um, so can you run that stuff off of a little uh, cell battery? As far as the, as far as the Z-Wave stuff? Yeah. Yeah, so when you buy your commercial, your consumer devices I mean, like window sensors, they, they last for a couple of years usually, and they have batteries embedded in them. So, and then you can switch them out. But yeah, pretty much any wireless, like if you look at the door lock I have here, it's got a battery compartment. This is from the inside. And uh, it pops out right here. You can kind of see the batteries right there, but it's just four uh, double A's. So. How long does the battery last on the door lock? On the door it's lock? The motor yeah, remember. the motor is killer, right? So I don't know yet, because I just got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they always claim it lasts a couple years, but that means it lasts a year, right? So Mine we'll, we'll have to see. Two years. What's that? Mine lasted two years. Did it? Oh, so they, they speak the truth. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So if I want to make my own device to live on the Z-Wave network, can I? Or That's, that's the biggest gripe I have with Z-Wave. Yes, you can, but you have to buy a license. And all of these programs that are open source, Z-Wave solutions, you can't have a license and release open source code because they make you sign a non-disclosure and they will come get you. And you have to pay like a $3,000 a year license to get the Z-Wave developer kit and chip access. So it's, it's no good. So the only reason to use Z-Wave is if you need to buy devices that are already made. If you know how to do manufacture devices, I would highly recommend Zigbee, even though the protocol is a lot more difficult. Um, if you thought that hex was difficult, you're in for a load of hurt, but uh, um, Zigbee's the way to go if you're doing your own devices, in my mind. Yeah. yeah. So what are you using for inputs? You have your lock in your door, you're up, you walk up to the door, now what? Do you pull out your phone? Does it? Does yeah, it and so face? basically with, like, with that API, yeah, you, you can do anything you want, right? So right. yeah, you can make your input your phone. You particularly. Yeah, use my phone. Yeah. yeah. In fact, we were working on, it hasn't worked yet, I'm trying to get access. I'm not a Java developer for my Android phone, but we're trying to use PhoneGap to access the GPS in the phone, and so that when I get remotely close to my house, it just unlocks, and then I can go in. 
And so that was kind of the idea behind that. And that's the thing, the world is, you're unlimited in what you can do when it's easy to work with, right? So if you have easy JavaScript, JavaScript libraries, you can do whatever you want. So that's kind of the cool idea, but I do use my phone, yeah. Yeah. Have you experimented at all with like, what Logmar has to this question of NFC and Bluetooth pairing with just the device itself and then just monitor its status back to a central point? No, I haven't done anything with the NFC, no okay. Bluetooth, anything, sorry. And then what about adaptive learning for in the home environment? So yeah, that's the coolest thing. So like the that's Nest, that's what it does, right? Yeah. So it tries to do adaptive learning and knows and monitors your patterns. And while I haven't looked at that, my buddy um, Jordan Crabtree here, who's just a math major out of college, loves machine learning. And so I've got him tasked on that. He's taking all the data points from home, our home and saying, oh, let's look and see, you know, how can we make things more efficient? How can we save you money? Um, but there's a lot to that, right? So. Not only do we need the data points of when everything gets turned on and off, all the events, it needs to know proximity. And we need to have an app of some sort that will allow us to know when everyone in your family, where everyone in your family member is, which gets kind of... Chip Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 yeah. I've, just, I've just been experimenting with like the Adreno board with you an RFID reader for your garage door and your door. You could put awesome. an RFID tag on all your yeah. kids. <laughs> <laughs> he says you can put an RFID tag on your kids. Yeah, that would be cool. I've seen those, you guys probably seen those blog posts where people have searched a clean planet RFID chips in their arm. That's pretty funny. You go go look for it. There's a few people who have done it in the middle like, Yeah, open my garage, open my door. <laughs> so that seems a little extreme, but people do it. Yeah, yeah. The garage. That's true. I could just wear this, but then someone steals your lanyard and it's like, I'll just hang it up in your garage. Yeah, 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 I guess. Well, but you, you say that, but let's do, maybe you lose your phone. Someone At least there's a password on my phone, right? In the lanyard, you can just go oh, use I anywhere. Mean, I mean for tracking inside the house. Oh, yeah. No, totally. That would be a good idea. Yeah, if you're, if you're doing tracking within the house, it'd be awesome. So I just ordered my first motion detector, Z-Wave motion detector. And that's kind of the and the way I'm going with that, to do a little bit more tracking in the house. I want so that when I go get my baby, up at you know two in the morning when she's awake. I don't want the lights to come on full blast. I want if it's after a certain hour, I walk into the hallway and the lights come on to 10%, just so I can see um, things like that. Um, I know uh, last time I went and got a tour of Vivint, they're integrating door, the doorbell into Z-Wave, so that like you're at work and someone rings your door, you're not home, you're like, huh? Look at your security camera. Yeah, I'm gonna unlock the door for you, and you can put that package inside, and then. I'll lock it on your way out, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot you can do um, once the devices get there, and the devices are coming, so re more rapidly all the time. Yeah? Do you see the like, retrofitting a home? Because like, my house was built in 1950, yeah. and it's yeah. cost prohibitive for me to do it, but new construction. I've, I've seen a lot of stuff in new construction that is really lending itself to being connected to this. Yeah, and totally. W at what point do you see that like new homes are just sort of like, base level connected as far as like furnace lights and garage door babies. I mean, like that just comes soon, right? So I went to the Utah Home Show just to see what was going on and we went in and with my wife and there was probably four or five different home automation companies in there and two of them I talked to already had con had contractor licenses for all new builds they were putting in this stuff. And these were Z-Wave technologies so I don't think wireless is going anywhere. When it comes to door locks, sensors, things like that, it's got to be a wireless technology. And when you're looking at it in that light, retrofitting a home still works, right? I mean, you can still retrofit your stuff with wireless because you don't need to run wires through the walls. Um, but as far as furnace integration, things like that, that's still new, right? We still, see, we, they just announced the, the washing machine and the microwave that now connects to Wi-Fi. But again, they're all using their proprietary cloud. They don't have open APIs. And so we have to come up with solutions that are more open that will work across the board for our own system. So. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks for coming, guys. <laughs>